Welcome to, the, to today's session called Teaching for the 21st Century. I'm sure this isn't the only way of doing it, but this, uh, what I want to think about in this lecture really is how we got to where we are, where we are, and where we might want to go next, really. So, but first of all, I'd just be curious to know how long people have been ringing. Is there anybody in the room that's been ringing for more than 40 years? Can you just wave? So, a fair smattering of people. Has anybody been ringing for more than 10 years? That includes the people who have been ringing for more than 40, obviously. <laughs> right, so that's the majority. Is there anybody that's been ringing for less than 10 years? So, uh, uh, less than a quarter, I would say, just as a quick guesstimate. So, we're obviously attracting people who've been um, ringing for some time and are quite experienced at ringing. I wonder if you can remember learning. Cast your minds back to when you first learned. Was it winter? Summer? Who taught you? It was years. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So what I'm going to ask is, who actually can't really remember how they really let their handling? Just wait if you thought you can't remember. Quite a few people can't actually remember the process. Well, I can remember very plainly when I learned to ring. Because A, it wasn't very long ago, and B, it was a disaster. Do come in, do come in. Do come in, do come in. Yeah, do come in. Oh, right, okay. okay. They've lost somebody, I've lost my husband. Oh, that's what I should say is, do you want to put your mobiles on silent? Because we might get into other otherwise. I can remember Learn to Ring. What happened was they re-hung the bells in our local town with millennium money. And we went to, a, my husband and I went to a party at Christmas. And um, they said, um, we're looking for lapsed ringers. Well, he'd been lapsed for 31 years. He'd been ringing Cambridge Royal when he was 16, but then changed schools to the sixth form and really virtually stopped ringing at that point. Do come on in, guys. Don't stand up when there's a seat to sit on. And so I was sitting in front of the television set, and he said, well, I'm bringing practice in 7.30 to 9, and then 9 came, and went, and 9.30, and 10, and 10.15. And I thought, that's a bit funny, and suddenly he rolled up. I, said, I thought you said it was 7.30 to 9. He said, it is. But you always go down the pub on. <laughs> so the next week, I was sitting in front of the television set again, and I suddenly thought, why? Why am I sitting here in front of this television set? I've got one child gone to university, one child on the gap year, I, I'm, I'm not tied to this house anymore, so I got in the garden, went down to the tower, and there was a local tower that had been asked to look after us and get us going, sort of thing. And this chap let me chime a bell, and he gave me some backstrokes, and I went back the next week, and he gave me some backstrokes, and I went back the next week, and he wasn't there. And so I went back the following week, which on week four by now, and somebody else was there, so they gave me some backstrokes, and on week five they gave me some backstrokes, and on week six he wasn't there. So, um, do come on in, do come on in. No, you're happy. Um, and so my husband said, well, we'll take you to a tower where there's somebody who can teach you. So they did some backstrokes with me. I was now on week seven. I'm beginning to think, well, where is this going? So my husband said, right, well, I'll teach you to ring. Well, he'd never really taught, and I'd never learned. And we broke two stays in two weeks. And I thought, well, it's the whole thing. Eventually, I did learn to ring. I got out the Central Council video on faults. I have them all. And, um, and I was beginning to think, my, I, my job when I was working was a physiotherapist. What I was dealing with was movement, human body, musculoskeletal movement. And I just thought, I'm afraid that I don't think the modern idea of how skills are developed and how movements are built has actually penetrated through into the world of teaching bell ringing. So I sort of put that as a little marker in my mind's eye. That was my first little marker that some further information on skills building might be useful to bell ringing. About, about four years later, some of our ringers had children who were now growing to sort of the end of primary school age group. And um, four of these girls wanted to learn to ring. Well, I took um, advice from Jill Hughes over there when I was standing in the queue at an open day one day, and she said, don't take more than three at once. So I decided to do them in two lots of two. We teach the first two and we teach the second two when they could ring round. So my husband said to me, it'd be very interesting to see if you can. And I thought, hmm, I'm, I'm reasonably confident about that compared to what 
my learning experience was. And it went really, really well. We taught them intensively, we followed the principles, they quickly got confident. And we go around the place and people would say, your learners are confident, your learners are confident. And then the vicar started coming to us and saying, will you teach us the handling stage? And so we started fitting these principles of skill development and intensive handling together to actually be useful in the area. After a while, we noticed that we weren't the only tower with youngsters of that age. So what we decided to do was to get them all together, and we formed a group called Kids Ring Out. Um, on the 1st of January um, 2004, we did our first outing, starting after lunch for obvious reasons. And we did three towers, and we went to a pub, which was open, which was quite rare on New Year's Day, where they could play pool and run around and do whatever they did. We had several objectives with Kids Ring Out. The first really was to get them together and get to know each other and get some social life going. The second was to get them more time on the rope, up this more intensive treatment, give them more learning time without them really knowing that they're learning by going around bringing in different towers, they're experiencing different bowels and that sort of thing. Three was to give them a bit of a sense of, you know, a bit of a more sense of a vision of, of what was out there, bigger horizons. They could meet better ringers, they could go to different towers, they could hear people talking about stuff. And the other thing was just to have a bit of fun, really, just to enjoy ourselves. And this worked really well. We started doing intensive handling teaching and we ran courses all the time. We, we didn't do them on a regular basis every month, we did them ad hoc to need. So if we saw four people who were learning to play and hunt, we ran a play and hunt course. And always, always we backed it up with theory. We always had theory sessions, practical sessions, and then probably finished off the practical sessions with a, a, a court appeal if we could, something like that. Um, um, what we were doing obviously must have got noticed, because in 2006, Kids Ring Out won the Founders Prize for the Encouragement of Young Ringers. So that was a big boost to us, really, because we didn't realise that we could win that sort of prize. And when the youth striking competition first started out in London, um, we put in a banner, we came second. So we, we got an A star and we came second, so we were pleased. And this was all done by teaching with this approach of good handling <coughs> and proper foundation stems within the learning programme. About 2005, um, the Land of Monmouth, which is where I come from, was short of Central Council representatives. So I was put forward to be a rep, and when I got there, I went onto the education committee. And when I got there, they were had recognised there was a, there was a, a dearth, a paucity of resources for teachers. They'd had some nationwide meetings, and they'd um, decided that what was needed was a resource for tower captains. And they were working on this thing called the tower captains resource. And I thought, ah, oh, this is a good idea. What I'll do is I'll write up all my theory of intensive style handling using John Harrison, I don't think he's here, John Harrison's very good book, The Tower Handbook, which has got a lot of stuff in it as well, and put it all together and give it to Heather Peachy, who was drawing together this Tower Captain's resource. I sent it off to Heather saying, would you like this? She said, no, not at all. It's not at all what I want. Um, we're not looking for this sort of tool, but why don't you, uh, this sort of item at all, but why don't you send it to John, who was at that time chairman of the education committee. So I sent it to him, and he said, yeah, this is great, we want something like this, but we need to add to it and augment it. And we worked on it for a couple of years, and in 2008 it was published, this book, Teacher, Teaching Unraveled, an evidence-based approach to teaching bell handling. It was referenced. I referenced it purposely because nobody knew the, who the hell I was and I wasn't a big posh ringer. And so, you know, so I thought it's necessary to do a proper job. So that, that came out then and that was... Um... Right. Unfortunately, in February of the same year, I happened to be dancing. I don't really dance. And I, I haven't danced since... But... I happened to be dancing at midnight at the Liverpool Students' um, Annual Dinner and suddenly there was a large bang from my right leg and my Achilles tendon snapped. It was a bit unfortunate really because it was the day that um, Liverpool put, put, were playing Newcastle at home. And I could just see what casualty was going to be like at midnight. So I said to my husband, we won't go now, I know what I've done, just give me some painkillers, we'll go in the morning, which is what we did. But then I got put into plaster for seven weeks. And we lived seven miles out of town with no neighbours, with a husband working her 12 hour day. So I was not going to be very amused. So I said, right, I contacted Heather. I said, you know, you're busy. 
um, with the tower captain's resource, I'll take it on for you if you like. I need, I need something to do. I'm going to be stuck in this kitchen for the next seven weeks. So I took that on, and eventually that got published as an online resource now called the Ring Practice Toolkit, which is published with the Central Council. So we were starting to get some resources together in a few ways. Then the kids ring out started growing up, and um, these two youngsters, Katie and Garrett, who were about 18 and 22 at the time, came to me one day and said, will you teach us to teach bell handling? I said, yeah, fine, absolutely, no problem, you've got to learn it, yes. Okay, so I looked around and I thought, there's nothing out there for them. I couldn't find any up-to-date resources for people like that. And I looked at Teaching Unraveled and I thought, I don't think so. They're not going to be switched on by a book like this. They want a, a man in the street version, a woman's own version, a daily mail version, something they can relate to easily. So I quickly whipped everything together and drew together the contents of this book, which is Teaching Tips, which is now the, the, the book that's used for the basis of the ITTS course. And within a month, I'd sold uh, 30 copies off my kitchen table without really telling anybody. So I thought, hello, hello, there's a bit of a demand for this. So eventually I took it to the Centre of Council, uh, the Education Committee, and it was published for everybody to buy. So basically, things were coming together. Everything was just growing organically and gently, and things in my head were coming together. So Guides and Katie came along with their learner, and we did three or four sessions, and then we got together on Saturday morning, we did an hour or something, went down the pub and had a coffee and came back did another hour, until the point where he was ringing, he was 19, he left very quickly, to the point where he was ringing the bell by himself, and I thought, right, that's okay, I'll go back to your side of Newport, and I thought, ooh, no. These couple of youngsters, they've never done it before. Am I just going to throw them out there and just say, get on with it? I can see all the issues coming up. So I said, I tell you what, we'll keep in touch. I'll come over sometimes, you get back to me, I will mentor you. So that was the next little step down the line of the things, that the straws that were coming together. The idea that teaching handling isn't easy and that if you're starting it for the first time, having somebody with some experience to work with you could be jolly helpful. And that mentoring process also came on to the um, ITTS course. Now, in 2009, the Ringing Trends Committee published their, what I'll call their shocking report. And this shocking report showed the demographics of ringing were aging. So I've got the figures here. 60% of ringers were over 50, and more scarily, 79, let's say 80, for rounding it up, say, percent of tower captains were over 50. But the research also showed that the most effective tower captains are in the age group 20 to 40. So we were looking at a downhill slope, as everybody perceives. And so everybody had a slight flutter, and the Ringing Foundation was born, which was a charity that was to get money together for the soft skills in ringing. Not bell restoration, not ringing centre equipment, but people projects. And the Ringing Foundation put out three briefs. They wanted somebody to work with youth work, they wanted a, a, a structured teacher training scheme, and they wanted a scheme for learners to work through in a logical manner. So I responded to the teaching one and the curriculum, if you um, like to call it one, in, and they turned out eventually to be the ITTS, the Integrated Teacher Training Scheme, and the Structured Training Scheme, the Progressive Scheme for Learners called Learning the Ropes. I took this back to the Education Committee and they said I could pilot it in South Wales. We ran the first um, slightly different course in 2009 at the end of the year in November. Um, so, I'll now tell you what those two things are. ITTS, Integrated Teacher Training Scheme. Well, what's integrated about it? Well, what is integrated about it is the fact that it integrates theory into the teaching. Understanding a little bit about the teaching progress, process, a little bit about the learning process, a little bit about how people get motivated, why people stick at things, and that sort of thing was interspersed with the practical sessions. I took advice about these presentations from somebody at Cardiff University who was drawing up students' courses, and he advised me about the duration they should be and that sort of thing so that so people would be able to um, maintain their level of concentration more easily. There are two sorts of delegates that come onto an ITTS course. One is the teacher who's inexperienced who's going to learn to teach, 
And the second is the mentor, the experienced teacher that comes along to work with the teacher that's less experienced. Thus giving, giving that help that I'd originally given to Katie and Garrett when they first came to me. Um, Earlier in 2010, we took the course to Essex. Is Liz Rayner in the room? Oh, I spoke to her early on. Liz Rayner, who was the education officer for Essex, kindly um, said she would feed back to me on the course. She's also happened to be head of maths at a large London comprehensive school and done a lot of maths training. And she came back to me, and after her feedback, we split the course into two days because we were just trying to cram so much into one day. I don't know whether you've ever... Any of, I can see a few faces here that have been on the courses, and they're pretty busy anyway. Imagine if we tried to fit the two into one, and that's what we were doing to, be, to, begin, to begin with. So after the course, um, it starts a period of the, of the mentor and the teacher working together. Now I'll just explain a little bit about learning the ropes. I'd gone around the country, and I was starting to lecture on the Hereford course and things like that, and do guild courses. There seemed to be this ringer who got stuck or these ringers that got stuck. There seemed to be a lot of people that could progress to a certain point, and then they just couldn't seem to progress any further. And when I looked into it, there were some, some reasons that I could see quite obviously. One is that sometimes their handling quality let them down. They just couldn't maneuver the bell slightly enough to make it ring methods nicely. Um, and the other thing is they hadn't had their road sight developed. I'll tell you a tale that I had a lovely 14-year-old girl come to me on an advanced plane hunt course, um, that's what we call when we um, are letting them learn the travel with rope sight. And she was struggling. She was struggling. She couldn't get the hang of this rope sight at all. And um, at the end of the day, the last ring, I said, right, okay, everybody choose what they want to do for their last ring. And she said, I want to ring a plane course of grounds and doubles off the four. And I thought, she can't even under the treble to a plane course of Bob doubles. But she could. She could ring. Um, a plain course of grounds and doubles off the four, and she could ring it jolly, jolly nicely. But what she didn't have was a transferable skill. She just learned it wrote. And so what was the point? She couldn't ring a different bell, she couldn't ring a different method, she didn't understand any theory, she didn't, under, she didn't have any rope sight, and whoever had taken her to that place, in my opinion, was leading her up a blind alley, mm -hmm. encouraging her, over hot housing her, I can ring methods, when well, poor lass, if she spent a bit longer learning the basics, she might have gone a lot further in the, in the long run. So I decided, thinking again about Katie and Gowan, how were they going to get this lad that was now handling the bell by themselves with no guidance right the way through to, say, ringing Bob Minor? Did they really understand all the things that were out there for them and how to build all those skills? So I thought, right, well, we can, we can provide them with a framework, which is now called, I think it was Graham that came up with the... With the um, Name Learning the Ropes, a progressive scheme. And this is the little handbook that they have to tick off what they've done. It comes in um, five stages and it's quite well explained in these little blue um, leaflets that Rod Kylie had done for us. It starts off with foundation skills, bell handling foundation skills, passes through plain hunt, your first method, through to Bob Minor. We split it into an option if you prefer an even bell route or an an odd bell route to get to the same place in the end. And it is designed to build those transferable skills so that by the time you finish learning the ropes, you run six court appeals, including one of Bob Doubles on the inside. It is the intention of the scheme that at that point, a learner or a ringer could go to another tower, be shown, say, for instance, the blue line to St. Clements and say, right, OK, and I get that and I can, I can ring it later tonight or perhaps next week. So that you've got, and, and we noticed that if you could get people to a good, good Bob Minor ringer, there was lots of tabs that would bring them on. But the trouble was getting them there, and also the slightly an attitude problem, because I was talking to some people in the very far west of the country, and they said, hey, you're completely on the wrong lines. Don't, um, why, you only go as far as Bob Minor? And he said, that's where you need to start. I was thinking, there's so many people that can't get to that point, so um, that's right, so okay. So then, somebody said to me, the same chap that was advising me about the length of the theory course, they said, what you really need to go with this um, course is a Moodle site. And I thought, well, I'd never heard of a Moodle site, because I didn't really register it. And then one of our ringers, who's a web designer, said, what you need to go with this course is a Moodle site. 
So it's a form of website. It's a virtual learning envi environment. It was introduced by a PhD um, thesis by an Australian who lived in the outback and never had to send his homework work away on the plane. Now he could just, instead of giving it to his master by hand, he could send it in electronically. It stands for a Modular Object Orientated Distance Learning Environment. <laughs> and the thing about it is that we can keep all our records in there, we can put resources for learners, for teachers, for mentors, for tutors, all on there. And we can tell what we've done. For instance, I can tell you that by the end of July, we have 2,487 users registered to Moodle. And of those, 1,351 were new ringers taught by people who had gone through the scheme. And of that, there have been 703 certificates awarded through learning the road scheme. This is each level has a certificate that the teacher can have to, to present to their learner. Um, to, presented to a total of 473 uh, ringers. So it's a very useful tool because that, that sort of information in the future can be useful to the Ringing Trends Committee, I, I hope. But what happened now was things just began to grow. In 2010, we held 10 courses, seven courses. By 2012, we were 29 courses. We couldn't keep up. We couldn't keep up with the demand, making up the packs, sending them out, recording everything. And the Ringing Foundation were already sponsoring us for the course packs and the tutor travel. And they said, well, why don't you apply for a grant to employ somebody to do all that admin work? And we said, OK. But they said, um, there are conditions, and we said, oh, shame. <laughs> there were conditions applied. And one of the conditions was that we started something called the Guild of Bell Ringers Instructors. And I thought that sounded quite, quite boring. So we started instead the Association of Ringing Teachers of the Art. And to become a member of art through the ITTS scheme, you attend the course, you keep a log of your teaching experiences in a teacher training logbook to record what you've done. You, you have a, a review teaching session and you, there's an online um, multiple choice tick box test on the Google site. So that's where we're up to now. Um, the ITTS course comes in two days, teaching bell handling, teaching elementary change ringing. We are looking to changing certain things and you will find that there are these forms around you want your views. So what I'm going to do now is ask Graham if he'd tell us a little bit about the Association of Ringing Teachers. And then I'll just get back to you and just fill you in with what else we're doing and where we want to go next and then hopefully get some ideas from what we'd like to do from the audience. So I'll pass over to Ray. Can everybody hear? Yeah. Good. Okay, I'll try and keep my voice going as long as it can. So we were in a situation where we had to set up this guild of whatever it was but decided not to and go for the Association of Bringing Teachers in, instead. Um, and we were required to do that primarily because we had to employ someone. Um, but as soon as you set up an organization, there are lots and lots of things that go with it that you have to look at and you have to deal with. Not just the question of dealing with money, which of course was the big initial issue to pay salaries and such like. So one of the first things we had to do was decide, well, why are we here? What is art all about? And our mission is to improve the learning experience of new ringers. And generally speaking, the learning experience of new ringers in the past uh, has not been particularly good, and Pip's given a wonderful example of hers, um, so I don't think I need to give any more examples of how badly things can go wrong. So having decided that that was our, our mission in life, was then a question of how we're going to do it, and essentially we're going to do it by training teachers providing teaching materials, providing teacher and new ringer support in basically any way that we can think of. So having decided what our, our mission in life was, then we had to think about well, what about standards? Um, how are we going to organize this thing? And one of the very pressing issues is the question of good practice and professionalism. We want to be able to have a professional approach to teaching and supporting teachers. We are, after all, an organization of teachers, full stop. So with professionalism in mind, uh, we had to begin to look at some of the policies and behaviors that we needed to try and guide for our members and our teachers. 
There's another aspect too which I think is very important and that is the expectations of the outside world. We live in this wonderful bubble existence of bell ringing. We know all about it. We're the experts and yet we expect people from this weird place called the real world to come and join us. Um, and we're not actually very good at that. Um, because we expect them to come in and already have lots of knowledge and do what we say. And it doesn't really work like that. And one of the um, slides that we use in the introductions to some of our, um, both of our modules, in fact, deals with some of these issues. There are lots and lots of other things for people to do. Why choose Bowie? We need to make it interesting. We need to make it fun if we're going to attract people and we're going to keep them. Other, other activities often have very well established training schemes. And until recently, that's, you know, that's a little bit naff really. We don't go in for that, do we? The bell ringing, no, you cop over the end of the rope and have a go. But with most other things, whether it's dance, music, Aikido, or virtually everything under the sun, there's some sort of established training scheme. And we felt there was a need to address that as well. Uh, health and safety, safeguarding are big issues which we like to try and ignore if we can, but we need to have, we need to address that in other spheres in life, particularly sport, and there's a lot of similarity between learning a sport, a complex physical skill, and learning bell ringing, which is a complex physical skill. For most sports and music and teachers, you're not allowed within half a mile of someone until you've had proper safeguarding training and being vetted and goodness knows what, but we like to try and avoid that. You know, that's far too professional for bell ringers. Standards are an issue, and also there's an expectation from the outside world that there'll be very rapid achievement. The days when it might take you six months to get someone up to rounds are, are basically gone. People come in and they expect to achieve it in one session. We have to educate them that maybe it might take 10 hours, or 12 hours, or 15 hours, because it's quite it's quite a barrier to entry because it's quite a complicated learning process. But we have to do things that meet the expectations of the outside world if we expect the outside world to join us. And we have other issues. Our image is, is about Mars bars. Our training methods uh, are handed down from generation to generation. Uh, our organizations are Victorian generally and not all of them are fit for purpose in this day and age. And our environments, of course, are really modern, aren't they? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have these wonderful belfries with 1970s carpets, a pile of ropes in the corner that have been there for the last 30 years in case they're needed. Um, and somebody mentioned to me, oh, uh, the, the fire, the three generations of electric fire in the corner, <laughs> they've been thrown away. And somebody mentioned to me on my last course, the vacuum cleaners. They're normally two or three. <laughs> two or three vacuum cleaners that can't be used in the corner. You know, we're not actually making our environments particularly attractive. And we've got to pull out all the stops if we're going to encourage people to come and join us and be interested and have fun from what they're doing. So there's a lot of adaptation to take place. But one of the expectations, of course, is that we have certain standards and that we have best practice for our teachers. And as soon as you have an organization, you have to address all these issues. And that's proved to be quite comprehensive. If you go to sports clubs, you'll see safeguarding policies and equality policies and goodness knows what on the wall. We've got them in one place on, on the art website now. But these are there for a purpose. They're, uh, there to reassure the outside world that we do have standards in place and that we work to best practice and they're a good reminder to our teachers that we should have a professional approach to uh, the teaching process and the way in which we handle our new learners. So there's lots of advice there and we've received advice from people like Sport England, the NSPCC, lots and lots of other organisations have really good advice as to how to manage these situations. These policies and best practice are expected, not just by the outside world, not just by the mother and father of the child that is suddenly in your care for a few hours, but the Charity Commission. When we applied for Charity Commission status, Charity status through the Commission, 
we had to answer a load of questions on how we dealt with safeguarding and various other things. We are in the very early stages of applying for a, a, a large grant to support a national recruitment initiative and campaign over the years ahead. And I'm working with a, a professional fundraiser and her next stage is to say, right, we will look at your governance and I want to see all your policies to make sure they totally stack up because we're not going to ask anybody for 100, 200 grand until your policies are absolutely in place and they meet our approval. Hopefully they will be, as I wrote or crypt most of them. <laughs> Normally crypt, you know, they're all very simple. So in terms of the policies that we have in place which encourage good practice, there are quite a few of them, but they are simple and straightforward. There's nothing too detailed in any of them. Safeguarding is a pretty obvious one, but it's not very complicated. It's only a, a, a sheet of A4 giving you an idea of best practice. We are obliged to make sure that anybody teaching children has an appropriate CRB check. If you can't get one locally, we can arrange for it. We are obliged not just because we gave undertakings to the Charity Commission, but also for insurance purposes. It's a requirement. But more than that, that's what the parents expect. And frankly, I think that's a heck of a lot more important than any of the other stuff. Um, we also now have a facility for members to receive training, online training in safeguarding if they haven't received it from some other source. We have things like a photography policy, you know, photography is, and videoing is very, very useful in training people. We have to be very careful how that's managed afterwards. Parents do not expect to see videos of their kids appearing on YouTube or anywhere else for that matter. Health and safety is another one. Basic, good practice for health and safety. It's a very live issue at the present time. We will have an advisor who helps us, a, a, a retired uh, health and safety executive. And if anybody has an accident, however it's sm small it is, our members can go on, complete a form, and we get advice back. And it's very important that we know about anything that occurs, because if there are any trends occurring, then we can have a look at the processes and decide whether something <coughs> needs changing before we get a claim. There were two others quite interesting ones that came out of the work which we've done recently. First of all, as part of the Charity Commission at work, we have to have a policy for the disadvantaged because charges are often made. Uh, we charge for a course, for instance, and I had to explain what would happen if somebody couldn't afford it. Not complicated, we'd ask someone else to pay, like the local association, the church, or if absolutely desperate, we might let them go for free. But then we have to have a policy to explain what would happen in those circumstances. And the more interesting one, and the final one that I was involved in recently, was uh, conforming with the Equality Act. Because having uh, a system, a progressive system such as learning the ropes, there will be people who cannot do some of the things to achieve different levels. And there is a requirement on us to think of alternatives if somebody has some form of disability. And we now have a panel of people that a request will go to who will decide what alternative is appropriate if somebody through disability cannot complete it. And we also have a broad equality policy which basically says it doesn't matter what size you are, what colour you are, or anything else about you, your condition, you all have to be treated equally. Not an unreasonable thing in this day and age. So this gives us some structure, it gives us some form to the organisation. It helps teachers give a, a use of best practice so that we get some sort of commonality, hopefully through the country, and particularly in the way in which our teachers approach their teaching in a professional way, and that way it will also begin to meet the expectations and indeed the requirements of the outside world, the real world of which actually we're a part, but we don't always necessarily realise that we're part of it. Okay. Okay, so that's a bit about the association of bringing teachers, but I just want to talk a bit about what, what needs to be done out there and what we want to do. 
we're still low on resources. We've been working quite hard to get resources up. I didn't bring up um, a copy of our DVD, Learning the Ropes, which was rather foolish. The first thing we did was make a, a DVD about teaching bell handling, which is um, was made for us free by somebody, but it still costs a lot of money. It costs probably about 25000 if you were to pay for it. But he sells it to us for a tenner, and we sell it on to members at 12 and the general public at £15. Pounds. We, uh, we're working with other people. We're working with the um, Whiting Society, who today have just published this DVD, which is accompanied by a book called From Rounds to Rope Site. And that's a, um, they've really produced it, but in collaboration with us, we provided some of the video editors and things like that with them. Apparently, oh, thank you, there's the, there's the Learning the Ropes DVD. Um, apparently, because they're the Whiting Society and they're very good at on detail, they worked out how long it took to make this DVD, and apparently it took 300 hours. When we did this one, we just said it took a long time. <laughs> um, we need youngsters into ringing. We, as Andrew Wilby said at one central council meeting, he said, when I was a youngster, I went ringing with my mates. He said, today, if you're a wrong ringer, you probably don't go ringing with your mates. You don't go ringing with your parents. You go ringing probably with your grandparents. And that's the gap in ringing that we've got. So we got together a series of um, resources designed at working with youth groups. Ideas and best practice for running youth-orientated groups. And that is again, free to everybody on Moodle, but you can buy it for five if you want. When we discovered that people, it's all very well coming on a teacher training course, but they couldn't find a recruit. So we said, right, well, we obviously need some centralised uh, um, work with recruits, so we set up a, a recruitment advisor. Andrew, is he are you here? Andrew Alves is our recruitment advisor. He gets, to get, he gets together everything he can on how people have recruited. He's got a load of um, posters together. If you go to um, the PR committee, you'll find all those lovely posters on the walls of the ones that Andrew got together for us. And then we had a very kind offer of somebody else who kindly offered to make us a film. And we made this film called The Inside Story, which is a short little recruitment DVD. It's on YouTube, so anybody can see it. But if you wanted to buy it, use it for a, a meeting or a recruitment drive, you can have it on um, um, DVD as well. And then I was thinking back to the guides and Katie's of this world and how they were getting on with their teaching now. And they might be getting to the stage where the um, association or Barch might be saying, would you like to run a Bob Doubles course for us this time? And I was thinking, huh? Oh, where are the resources again? It's always where are the resources. So we decided to get together these set of resources which we call teaching toolboxes. They, each toolbox has in them four items. One, some general guidance notes so that they can say, oh, right, well, if I'm going to run a Bob Doubles course, what sort of skills am I looking for in the people that I'm going to take on to my course? Or likewise, in the tower, what sort of skills am I going to be wanting my readers to have before I move them on to Bob Doubles. <coughs> then there's a pack of, of, um, guided, of um, resources for the teacher that you can print off to use with your students and likewise for the students. And then each one also contains a PowerPoint presentation on the theory um, of the topic that you're dealing with. And they were rolling, if you go down to the main hall, those theory PowerPoints, or seven of them are on a loop presentation. And the, and, the, and the teaching toolboxes cover foundation skills, plain hunts, pop doubles, grants and doubles, plain bob minors, stepman doubles, and much more minor, which goes on through sort of, sort of Clements double Oxford, Surprise, Cambridge, Six Space Messers, and that sort of thing. If anybody would like to write some on big, larger numbers, I'm really a six star teacher, um, please have a look at them. And if, if you think there's a relevance, we could have some for the, uh, larger numbers. So, we need to look at what we're offering our teachers and our mentors and our, and our tutors. So for tutors, we now have a training program. We have peer review for existing tutors. Well, for mentors, we've developed a mentoring workshop so that they can understand the mentoring process better and the stages of development that a teacher goes through from not having taught to becoming an expert teacher. So to make the mentoring skills a little bit more honed. Um, what else did I want to say? We also run an annual conference. We've had two so far. Next one's going to be in Birmingham, kind of invited by the St. Martin's Guild. And up there we have a mixture of workshops and lectures and 
uh, anecdotal things, like we're, next year we're having um, the Taunton Way. The people from Taunton managed to recruit and keep 75 new ringers. Uh, that might be worth hearing about, so we've got that sort of thing. The Birmingham um, St. Martin's Guild has set up a whole new way of teaching ringing, and, uh, and I'm sure we'd all benefit from hearing that. Um, we're having some um, lectures on how to use, we had one this year, using bell tower and that sort of thing. We've had offers of using them on mobile and able and handheld devices. And we've also um, got a professional trainer coming along to do something called honing your teaching skills so we can up our teaching skills. We've got one on steeple keeping for people that might want to be thinking about taking over towers when they get a bit older and also on conducting. So people that, again, coming along to be the new tower captains of tomorrow will be able to go out and find out how to conduct some elementary um, uh, methods in their tower. Um, we need to communicate. When I first went onto the education committee, my question was, what happens with the people we can't get through to because they don't take the ringing world? And as we know, the part of people that take the ringing world is not only not very huge, but also not getting any larger. So communications is a big issue. ART puts out artworks every quarter. There's a few up here for you to come and have a look at with various. And it goes to everybody on Moodle, plus it goes to guild secretaries, and plus it's now going to central council members. We decided that if the local leaders could be coordinated, they might be able to offer things to one another. So Paul over there, so you don't have to start up Paul if you don't want to, kindly took on the role of being our local organiser and local leader coordinator. He communicates with those people monthly and gives them facility to communicate with one another. We have an independent educational advisor. This is one of the things that was the Green Foundation insisted on for condition of the grant. Um, Stephanie Pattenden from London has kindly taken on that role. She's a retired headmistress and she comes in and she looks at our materials and attends our courses and gives us advice and reports back. Um, and as I said, not only did we pr produce the the DVD of um, recruitment, but we have our advisor that people can contact. There's just a couple of other things I wanted to say before I bore you to there. Um, no, I think I think you can finish your suffering now. I think I've said everything I intended to say. So we would like to take questions of several of us around, several tutors and people around. So has anybody got any comments, <coughs> questions, suggestions, anything you want to say from the audience, basically? 